Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, you know, we've been doing these, these updates for um, more than a year, I guess about 14 months, and they've just evolved into a way for all of us to come together as a community and celebrate all different aspects of life at the cathedral, life in New York City. Um, you know, we've, we've had conversations that have been very serious. We've had conversations that have been joyful, like the one we're having today. Um, so we're just, we're grateful for all of you to just, you know, come together with us and, and just celebrate um, what we all hold so dear. Um, one of the things that um, many of us hold dear are peacocks. And so we are thrilled today to um, have author Sean Flynn, whose recently published book, Why Peacocks, has been reviewed in the Times, the Post, to, to great acclaim. And uh, it features a chapter on our very own Phil, Harry, and Jim. So we're very pleased they've become celebrities. Um, Sean's also an award-winning journalist. He reports for GQ. He's reported from around the world. So he has a very storied career. Um, and he and the Dean will talk about um, what brought him to North Carolina with the little furry feathered friends you see behind him. So I'm going to uh, hand it over to the Dean. Okay, thanks Priscilla. Just a, a, a couple of updates about what we've been up to uh, since last we were together. Uh, this, this past year, as we all know, has been so difficult for so many of us. Uh, and even still, uh, throughout that time, this cathedral kept demonstrating our love for this community. And uh, we've taken the front steps of the cathedral and turned them into a, a front porch for our community. Uh, since we couldn't go into the cathedral to gather, we started gathering on the steps of the, of the cathedral and, and it's become a community gathering place. Uh, but our regular programming goes along as well and is flourishing. Uh, the child care and summer camp, the ACT program, uh, Advancing Community together, together is now 50 years old and untold numbers of children and adults uh, have come together and advanced the community together. This provides childcare and daycare and uh, after school care for children who are, uh, whose parents are working and help, uh, we help especially uh, the students with uh, financial aid needs. That's one of the big things that we are working on now. Uh, we are also working on a brand new project. Well, of course, our community, Cathedral Community Cares continues as well. Uh, last Sunday, we served over 400 people uh, a lunch on Sunday. Uh, so they had uh, a lunch and usually a bag to go with a sandwich uh, for the evening meal as well. But the, the need continues, the need continues. And the cathedral is stepping up. A new, a new initiative for us uh, is the intentional community. Uh, this is going to be done in conjunction with uh, Sherman Neuf, a French, the new way, an ecumenical community, a Roman Catholic ecumenical community. Uh, we're going to establish, our plans uh, are to establish the community here at the cathedral. We'll start uh, with a, a few young adults and perhaps older adults, the community is open to all, to live together in a, a semi-monastic uh, life with a regular prayer, regular quiet, regular service, regular work. Uh, it, it's all being shaped now. The response has been great. Uh, we've received encouragement from Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury. The Vatican has indicated its, its excitement and interest in this program. Uh, we're extending talks with uh, our Greek Orthodox and Armenian Orthodox neighbors. 
to include them in this uh, exciting program that marks new, new fields for our, the ecumenical movement uh, in the United States. Well, all that, uh, this is, uh, oh, and, and by the way, speaking of community outreach, the Scola Cantorum is resumed, uh, calling children from the neighborhood who may not have otherwise have had access to uh, quality music education. And that an ensemble will share in the great cathedral tradition of singing uh, that has been a hallmark of St. John the Divine for 120 years. So this is another exciting way in which the cathedral steps up to serve the community in which we live. Well, let's see if we can turn now to uh, our special guest, Sean Flynn. Where are you, Sean? There you are. Thank you so much for joining us. Dean Daniel, thank you. I mean, I, I couldn't be more delighted to do this. It's um, uh, St. John was, was, I think, the favorite place I went. Uh, researching this book and I went to a lot of places um, yeah. but you guys are really the best I remember uh I, I, I don't remember you at uh St. St. Francis Day the, that you write about in the book but I do remember you soon after that when you appeared here on the uh the close I remember Lisa called and said there's a guy who wants to talk to you about peacocks he he claims to be writing a book about <laughs> And I thought, well, okay. You know, we get these kind of people every once in a while, shall I say. Yes, you do. Um, uh, and that was, was uh, Lisa might be my favorite New Yorker of all time. Um, all right. Because as you say, you know, when you call people and you tell them that you're a journalist and you're writing a book about peacocks, um, it's hard to get traction. <laughs> they, they, they often assume that, that, one, you couldn't possibly be a journalist and maybe you've just got some pictures that you want to get self-published somewhere. But anyways, when I called Lisa and told her uh, who I was and what I was doing, the first thing she said was, we have peacocks too. We could have a book party. And it was, uh. it was like this, this bright beacon in, in this sea of, of dismissive rejection that I've been getting for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, so it, it, it set us off on a good foot. Yeah. We hear them. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're uh, a little noisy this time of year, but this is also when they're they're pretty too. So <laughs> it's well, mating you've season. You've trained your peacock so well. This is Carl, I think, standing with. This is stuff. Carl. Have you you've trained him to stand still like that for how long before? He is he still out? he's still standing still, huh? Yeah. Well, you just got to keep tossing him blueberries, and, and he'll stick around for a while. <laughs> Good job. Speaking well, Sean, of which. Uh oh, blueberries. No, we're good. Yeah. There you go. Yep. There you go. Uh, I know when when you came and spent the day at the cathedral exploring the peacocks that uh, you you said I live I live outside uh, Durham, North Carolina, and I thought, wow, I'm from North Carolina, uh, from Goldsboro. But I, I take it Durham was not your, uh, and Durham County was not your home turf. Where, uh, what prompted you to move to North Carolina? So uh, Louise and I, uh, my wife, we were living in Boston at the time. Uh, I was born and raised in Cleveland, but spent the better part of 20 years in Boston. Um, when we met, Louise lived in Brooklyn, uh, but she's from Tennessee originally. And we were living in a, an adorable, but very small house uh, north of Boston. And it's cold in Boston. It, it's, I mean, it's, it's, you know, six months out of the year are, are not terribly pleasant. Um, so we'd always been looking for somewhere else to go. Uh, you know, whenever we traveled anywhere, Louise would start scouting houses. And it, it um, as it happened, her father was getting cancer treatments here in Duke, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, at Duke, which is in Durham. And between radiation and chemotherapy, they would amuse themselves by looking at houses. And she happened to stumble upon this 100 year old farmhouse was a big old barn that was an even trade for a little house in Boston and seemed like a nice place, so, which wow. it is, by the way. We, we are in the city limits right near the county line, but uh, Durham is a wonderful yeah. place. Yeah, it is. It is. We, uh, I remember talking with you and you're saying that part of the motivation 
uh, for writing this book was that nobody had ever written a book about uh, peafowl or peacocks before. Uh, yeah. And that was what that was what started uh, uh, started you wondering about it. Uh, but I'll have to say, as I read the book, and by the way, I, I can show you what it, what the cover looks like, so you can find it in your bookstore. Uh, it 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 is about peacocks, but it's also a very different book. It's about you and your family and beyond. It's, it's a very different book from what I had expected when I picked it up. So I learned, uh, a, whole, I learned a whole lot about peacocks, but uh, I learned a whole lot about you too. And it's fascinating. I, I, I don't typically write about myself. So, so I appreciate that I, that I held your interest. Um, it's not the book that I set out to write either initially. Um, this was, yeah, I, I wish I could say that I, that I got these peacocks with the brilliant idea of writing a book about them, but it, it didn't work out that way. Um, yeah. I got the peacocks for reasons that are, I explore in the book, um, but it was my editor, Simon and Schuster, who saw the potential here very early. Um, he, uh, I was between projects and we went out to dinner and I was talking to him um, and he asked what I was working on. At the time, I told him the truth. Not not much. I'm I'm you know kicking around some magazine ideas and have some book ideas and stuff. Uh, but mostly, I've been just hanging out at home with my weird pets. And he asked mm -hmm. about my weird pets, and I said that I have a, a pug puppy that I'm I'm very conflicted about, and I have some peacocks, and I have these chickens that I taught how to do tricks. The chickens I was the most excited about. I, I taught right. them to do tricks. Uh, he cut me off and said, "Wait, wait, 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 wait. You have peacocks. Why do you have peacocks?" Um, I didn't have a good answer and I didn't know much about peacocks. In fact, if, if you recall, by the time we were walking around the close, I still didn't know much about peacocks. I was having a hard time getting researchers to take me seriously, <laughs> um, which they did eventually, but um, I didn't really think much of it. But he called me back the next day and he's the one who pointed out that no one's ever really done a book about peacocks, uh, which didn't necessarily surprise me. Um, but he said, the book, he said, what he said to me was, you spent 30 years flying around the world writing about death, which is generally what I write about, a lot of crime, a lot of disaster. Um, he said, you know, so you fly around the world, you write about death, and then you retreat to your little mini farm in North Carolina, where you hang out in a big cage with your magical, mythological, supposedly immortal birds. Hmm. You really ought to try to figure out why you're doing that. Um, so I did. It, it took a while. Um, there was some stuff that I had to figure out and work through, but, uh, if he hadn't pushed me to do this, uh, which I'm delighted that he did, um, it, it, it probably wouldn't be here today. So yeah, it, it started off in a different place than, than where it ended up. Good. I'm, I'm noticing in the background that Mr. Pickle has begun his display as well. Uh, yeah, and he, just, he used just, to be my... just to say, this is a live broadcast. None of this is, uh. There's no, there's no fake screen back there or pre-recorded. It's live. What I, I see Ethel and Mr. Pickle and Carl, and here they are. Yeah. What, what, what's been your central learning about peacocks? Or if I don't, I know that's no, a that, hard that's, question. It, it's not really because it's, it's not peacock specific. Um, what I eventually figured out. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. I figured out they're noisy. That, that's my first lesson. Um, <laughs> no, what, what, so we have spent, humans, we, 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 um, we have foisted a lot of things on the peacock. You know, we, we take a lot of our human foibles and, and toss them on a bird. It's arrogant, he's vain, he's prideful, and then he's ashamed when his feathers fall off. Um, he's just a bird. You know, it's, it's Carl doesn't know that, that we find this whole display stunning, and he doesn't particularly care. He's just living his peacock life. Um, right. I got these birds as ornaments, frankly, um, and pretty quickly discovered that they actually have personalities and, and they're kind of smart. And, you know, I can tell them all apart and, you know, mm -hmm. not just, you know, by physical characteristics, but how they act. You know, they, they behave differently around me. Um, they are, are. It all came back to a line that, that you had said. Um, in the book that, that, that always struck me as something. We were talking about, and this is really how ignorant I was. Um, 
we were talking, we were, you were feeding almonds to, to one of the birds. I, I couldn't even tell them apart at that point. Um, and I said, it was really a miracle that, that this bird survived long enough to even evolve. You've got this bright blue bird hanging out in the jungle with this big cumbersome tail hanging off of it. Makes it hard to run, hard to fly. And then they fan it out like a big billboard to announce, hey, Jaguars, come and eat us. Um, and I'd said, I said, I thought it was a miracle that they'd even evolved. And you were very quiet for a minute. And then you said that maybe a miracle is just life in God's kingdom slowed down enough for us to notice. Um, and that, that really stuck with me. And, and, and it informed a lot of the rest of the book. There's a lot of um, patience is what I think I learned from all of this. And uh, that I can't organize the world the way I want the world to be. So I need to accept it the way it is and mm -hmm. sort of embrace it for what it is. And it's not so much the world slowed down, it's us slowing down enough to notice what's going on around us. So that's yeah. really what I kind of got out of it in the end. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, <laughs> and one, th one thing you learn quickly as a parent, but be they two-legged children or four-legged children or whatever, is that uh, when, when you have more than you have hands, you've lost control already. And uh, you, right? How little oh, we can the, control. The two-legged ones take so much more patience. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Whether, whether they're human or, or peacocks, but yes, yeah. they take so much more patience. Uh, what do you, uh, are you, are you continuing writing uh, for, for GQ oh, yeah. and, and that? And do you have plans for another book? I've got some ideas um, that, are, that are still sort of toasting in the fire. Um, they haven't warmed up quite enough yet. Um, immediately in the immediate future I'm, I've moving <clears throat> I'm moving into audio um, this this these golden pipes here um, working on a, a five-hour show for audible on a shipwreck in the Bering Sea that became the Coast Guard's uh, wow. the largest Coast Guard rescue in history so a little bit of a switch um, but then yeah back to the magazine work um, looking for some book work um, you know like I said have some ideas kicking around Wow. Okay. Well, that we'll we'll look forward to seeing what. Yeah. They're very excited uh, about it. What What would you hope uh, is is people's biggest takeaway from from your book and your thinking and your writing? A lot of what we just talked about. Um, so when I I when I got these these birds sort of by happenstance. Um, I had spent many, many years writing about awful things, terrible things. Um, and I put each of those in a little, a little mental compartment. You know, you, you work on a story about this disaster or this mass shooting or this bombing and you it right. become an obsession for a few months and you put it away. Um, and I think like a lot of journalists, um, probably most of us, we, we get into this partly because we're curious. And on some level, I think we're trying to make sense of the world to try to bring some order to it. Um, to take these, these, these chaotic, horrific events and straighten them out and, and try to get perspective on them, which I'd always been able to do from uh, a sort of antiseptic distance. You know, I could get very close to people who, who, who would talk to me, um, but there was always that, that distance. And right before um, these birds showed up, uh, I was writing for the first time about a father um, whose son had died. He was a soldier. Um, and the death of the soldier was not particularly difficult to write. Um, but I got very close to the family and I was having to write about the father's grief, which is always harder to write about. But for the first time, I mean, really in, in 30 years, for the first time I could see in that soldier, my own son, uh, there were some very specific idiosyncrasies, um, some really specific little quirks that, you know, when they talked about their son growing up, I was like, wow, that is my son growing up. Um, so for, for the first time, I could really see myself in one of the people I was writing about. Um, and it rattled me. It, it, it rattled me quite a bit. Um, so I'd already started uh, you know, shifting away from writing about all the bad things and trying to figure out why I was writing about the bad things. And over the couple of years of pondering that and hanging out with these guys, and, and you, know, you know the ups and downs and, and the narrative arc, it, they, they are not magical nor immortal. <laughs> I've definitely <laughs> learned that. Um, yeah. 
but I, I did learn that, that, and this is what I hope people get out of it, is just to take the world as it comes. Um, I, I, I am not going to be able to order it to my liking. Um, things are going to happen. Things are going to die. Um, that was, you know, I spent all those years writing about death, but then when a pet dies, I, I go off and sleep once. I have no idea what to tell my kids. Uh, yeah. you know, I, so I, something like, like I'd learned to describe it without really absorbing it. Um, so to just slow down and, and, and take the world as it is and try to make your peace with it. Yep. That's a big, I wish learning. there was a bigger, I hope so. Cause you know, it, it's, I always feel like I should give an answer like, like, you know, that, that I've discovered this, the, 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 how to break the speed of light or something like, <laughs> like I've unlocked the key of the universe. Um, and maybe I have, maybe that's it just to slow yeah. down. Just slow down. Yes. Yes. That, that we're, we're not the center of the universe, whoever we are. No. Uh, no, uh, we're part of it, but not not the center. Uh, that's always my temptation is to think I'm the center of everything, right? But uh, and just you learn, you learn, don't you? That it's not true. It's a tough Sean. realization when it first hits you. Yeah, <laughs> Sean, thank you. I know oh, Dean, that thank you. You've taken a good amount of your time and valuable time, and uh, you've enriched us, enriched our lives and interests. And uh, I think maybe Priscilla has some questions for you, but I'd, I just I want to plug this book. Uh, I'll, I'll have to confess, it's not what I thought it was going to be when I picked it up. Uh, but when I finished it, I thought, gee, I'm glad. Well, I didn't think gee, but I thought, well, damn, I'm glad I've read this book. Uh, so I commend it to you uh, highly. Uh, you. Priscilla, do you have any uh, questions that people have? We have uh, many questions, actually. Uh, and um, as I asked them, Dean, would you like to share? I know you brought a friend with you, a white feathered friend. Oh, um, yes, this friend. Damn. This is. He's my favorite peacock. He's always quiet and doesn't talk back. I'm sorry. I was made to do this. I was an unwilling victim. But anyway, here yeah, we are. My apologies, but we couldn't let it go. Um, well, the first question is um, probably the most important one, which is why does the cathedral have peacocks? And why do they not run into the street? Is that for me or for Dean? Dan That's for Dean Daniel. For Dean Daniel or for you? Yeah. Well, I, I, the answer can be found in Sean's book. Actually, uh, they were. I, I, I'll spill a few of the beans. Uh, <laughs> some 40, 50 years ago, uh, a trustee, a cathedral trustee and uh, some, someone else get, got together and gave four P file to the cathedral. And that would be about 1980 or so earlier. And uh, as time went on and these P file went the way of all P file, uh, we got four more, three more. And uh, so today we have Jim and Harry and Phil. Uh, so it's sort of become a, a, a tradition. They came here as hatchlings and uh, have never known anything except wandering the close and uh, being themselves. And uh, next question is for Sean. Um, how did you know the cathedral had peacocks? And, um, you know, you'd mentioned that, that you weren't getting the reception you were hoping to get. Um, <laughs> why did you reach out to us? Uh, you know, it, it's for as much time as, as I spent in New York, I did not know this organically on my own. Um, uh, my best friend, Ted, went to Columbia. And as soon as I mentioned peacocks, he said, my God, you've got to go over to St. John um, and spend a lot of time. So that's where I learned. Um, a friend who used to wander the close. He always found some 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 peace and quiet over there. Yeah. Um, no, I know we have many people who um, who come just to visit the peacocks and just enjoy enjoy the the park. Um, the next question is for the dean. Um, how would you characterize the different personalities of Phil, Harry, and Jim? I mean, I know each oh. of 
downtown. Uh, Harry, but what's your perspective? Harry, one of the blue peacocks. Harry is the most uh, upfront of of them all. He has the the he's the boldest one. Uh, always, he's not aggressive, but he's he's right there with you. He follows me around when he wants a, an almond. And he spends a fair amount of time. I have a, a, a truck, a pickup truck, uh, that he stares into the bumper for much of the time and sometimes pecks at the bird at his own reflection. But Harry's the most uh, accessible one. Jim, Jim is quieter. And Jim has had severe medical problems with his feet and has spent months in the avian bird hospital. Uh, here in, in Manhattan. Uh, but he's, he's the quietest of the three and the most retiring. And Phil, the white one, uh, the white peacock is the moodiest. You never know when you go up to Phil. Some days he's going to greet you like a long lost peacock. And other days uh, he, just, he doesn't want to have anything to do with you. So I, they all have very distinct personalities. That's, that's Phil. The white one, yep, there he is, and all his beauty. And there he is uh, on St. Francis Day. And that's Harry. That's a really great picture of Harry. There's Harry again. Now, our next question is for Sean um, from Austin, Texas. Uh, someone who's been noticing more peahens and um, chicks in their local park. Um, you know, our, all of our, our peacocks are male, obviously. Um, so the question is, what are your observations about um, peahens and their chicks? So I haven't had any of my peahens sit on eggs. Um, so I can't speak to the chicks. But um, peahens are fabulous. You know, they, they, they don't have the colors. Um, but they do all the work. They are the sensible ones. You know, they're, they're the ones, you know, scratching out the nest and, and hiding from jaguars and foxes and, and raising these chicks. Um, the males, despite all of their big fancy plumage and everything, are very deferential to them. Um, when Carl and Mr. Pickle used to chase each other around, um, they would they would stop if, if, you know, one of the girls got in the way and they would sort of like wait for it to cross. And it's really kind of dear. So peacocks or peahens, um, if I had to choose between them, if I had to get rid of all of them and just keep one, I would keep Ethel, our, our sensible, sturdy peahen. Oh, that's great. That's her right there. Um, and now another uh, question is, are peacocks considered wild animals um, and do they live a long time? I mean, yes, and there are many feral colonies of, of peafowl around the country, um, around the world, really. It's, it's, these are, are you know, they're like zebra mussels. They, they've been spread all over the, all over the planet. Um, they can live in very cold climes. And what often happens is somebody has some, some ornamental peacocks uh, and then moves and just lets them go. And next thing you know, you know they breed like pigeons. Um, so yes, there are plenty of feral peafowl out there. Um, mine are not. They are technically just classified as poultry. Um, in the world of, of you know, poultry farming, they are a very, very tiny percentage of it. Um, so they don't actually get a lot of attention at all, but they are considered domestic fowl <laughs> in captivity, which mine are, by the way. So none of my neighbors have to worry about their bumpers getting pecked by some bird looking at its reflection. Um, and uh, our last question is, are you doing any book signing events in New York? Not at the moment. Right now, because of, of the pandemic, um, everything's been virtual, which has been, it's, you know, been, so I've, I've been to Wichita um, right, right from here. Um, but nothing yet, but we're hoping to get something lined up over the summer. Oh, that's great. Well, we'll be sure I to certainly. let everyone know on this call when, when that happens. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, of course. Um, well, before the um, Dean gives his um, closing remarks, I want to thank you all so much um, for joining us. And as always, any questions, just feel free to email me or call me. Um, I think you all have my contact information. And um, we're going to plan one or two of our updates over the summer and then uh, resume in full force in the fall. 
Um, and so we look forward to uh, sharing uh, the date of our next event with you. So um, I'll turn it over to Dean Daniel for final remarks. Okay. Well, Sean, first of all, thank you uh, for being so generous with your time, uh, with, with setting us up in the barn here so we can <laughs> see the boys and the girls and uh, for sharing your book with us. It would not have been the same book without you. So it's the least I could do. And I've enjoyed every minute of it. Well, it's, um, I can't believe I'm going to say this. The book is a real feather in your cap. And, uh, <laughs> God, that's so bad. <laughs> uh, I couldn't resist. But thank you. We wish you well in your uh, career and hope to see you again here at the cathedral sometimes. I hope so too. Okay. God Thanks. bless. And thank you all for joining us.